Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our lecture series on Japanese history. And in the last talk, uh, I talked, I looked at uh, the Middle Ages in Japan, especially uh, the establishment of uh, the Kamakura uh, Bakufu. And I just touched on some of the basic uh, events of that time period without going into too much detail. So today I'm going to continue that lecture, go into a bit further detail, and look at especially uh, arts and literature and some of the other cultural developments uh, that occurred during uh, the, this period in the Middle Ages, especially the Kamakura uh, period, looking from the beginning to the end of the Kamakura period, uh, and then as well as the, the toppling of, of the Kamakura government uh, by uh, the Ashikaga uh, shoguns and the establishment of uh, their new capital in the Mudomachi area of Kyoto, and then thus marking the beginning of the Mudomachi period. Okay, so we'll get started. And let's see, get my pointer here. Okay. So I want to start by looking at uh, how Buddhism developed in the Kamakura period. And previously, uh, in past talks, I might have touched on some of the roles of Buddhism a little bit, uh, some of the political uses and uh, utilizations of Buddhism, uh, and, some of the, and looked at some of the reasons of why it might have been especially popular for the ruling classes. Uh, and I think I mentioned as well that the emperor, for instance, would have made himself or herself uh, uh, not only the head of doing Shinto rites, but also uh, the head of Buddhism as well. So it, it gave the ruling class uh, a, an added level of legitimacy of, and uh, their, their daily lives were uh, greatly intertwined with um, not only performing governance, but also uh, performing religious rites, both Shinto and uh, Buddhist rites together. So in this sense, the two former roles up, to, up until the Kamakura period were basically to protect the country and to serve the elites. But during the Kamakura period, new types of uh, popular Buddhism began to emerge that appealed to not just the elites, but to average people as well. Uh, and this included especially Jodo Shu, Jodo Shinshu, uh, the Zen sect, uh, Soto Rinzai, for instance, and uh, Nichiren Buddhism. Um, and this Jodo Shu, this is translated into English as Pure Land Buddhism. This was taught by Honen. Uh, Honen was born as a peasant, and he went to study at the main center of Buddhist learning at the time, uh, Enbyakuji, which was on, uh, which is located on Mount Hiei. Uh, and this was the Tendai school of Buddhism. And interestingly, Buddhism at, at this time, even though it was basically to serve the ruling classes to protect the country, um, it was one of the few ways that someone of a peasant rank could actually move up in society through studying to become a monk. Um, so this is what happened in the case of Honen. But as he, as he studied um, and looked over ancient Buddhist texts, um, he, he was interested in lines that talked about uh, the importance of saying the Nembutsu, Namu Amida Butsu, and that just by uttering this phrase once, anybody could be saved. And he picked up on uh, this particular teaching of some texts and made it his main teaching um, of what eventually became his new sect, Jodoshu, Pure Land Buddhism. And importantly, Honen then advocated salvation for all people, from the lowest peasant to the wisest monk. And this is a, a huge a radical break from previous forms of Buddhism, which hadn't really been that much concerned about the salvation of average people or what happened to them in the afterlife. Uh, Honen's disciple was Shinnan, uh, 
and he carried on Honen's teaching and eventually split off from him a bit, forming true Pure Land Buddhism. So this would be Jodo Shinshu. Um, and Shinran was an equally uh, uh, radical character for the time. Uh, for instance, he took a wife in violation of previous uh, customs for Buddhist monks. Um, well, the imperial court uh, did not take a very strong liking to uh, the new sect of Buddhism, or the new kind of Buddhism promoted by Honen and Shinran, and they were both banished and outlawed uh, by the court in 1207. They were eventually allowed back in 1211, owing to the sheer popularity uh, of the religion. Um, but they did certainly recognize it as uh, kind of a threat to their rule and their way of life, but um, the fact that they had to kind of concede that, well, it's already become so popular, uh, just kind of indicates, you know, how seriously they, they took that threat and actually having to allow it and to kind of cede some ground to middle-ranking aristocrats and, and even average uh, peasants. Perhaps even more radical was Renyo, uh, who in later centuries actively proselytized among uh, peasants, and he was persecuted by Tendai monks. So he moved his um, teaching to Omi and then to Echigo provinces. And one of the, the ways that he tried to establish support was by um, working through local uh, so organizations, village councils in local villages, uh, and they would form meeting places called dojo. Um, and uh, the peasants believed, one of, one of uh, the reasons that uh, they were eventually feared by elites is that the peasants believed that by making donations to the main temple of Jodo Shu Honganji, that they would be saved. Um, but this made them less willing to pay taxes, and it led to conflict then between the provincial governors, the Shugo, and then these bands of kind of radical revolutionary peasants, uh, many inspired by religious motives, uh, Iko Iki. Uh, in, Ka in Kaga province, for instance, the band of Iki actually toppled the Shugo there and controlled the whole province. So uh, in this sense, um, the, the new Jodo Shu, Jodo Shinshu uh, sects of Buddhism eventually gained a lot of political control, but it was mainly based on popular support. Some of the other sects of Buddhism would be uh, Nichiren Buddhism. Nichiren was born in a poor fishing family in Chiba and he traveled around Japan studying Buddhism, and he decided that the Lotus Sutra, the Hoke Kyo, uh, was the most important. It was the only true path to salvation. So in a sense, these new forms of Buddhism are a bit more dogmatic. They pick up on a certain part of Buddhism and say this is the only true path, but at the same time, they're also much more, uh, they have more much more popular appeal because they can say, uh, they say at the same time that um, the salvation is available to anyone. Um, Nichiren too was briefly banished to Sado Island. Um, and then meanwhile, Zen Buddhism was especially popular with the samurai class around Kamakura, but again, the samurai class, they're not necessarily elite aristocracy. This was a new warrior class, as I mentioned in, last, in the last talk. Um, some of them coming from just average regular peasant backgrounds. Um, Eisai created the Rinzai sect and Dogen created the Soto schools. These remain important uh, schools of learning today. And one role that Zen Buddhism played in Japan, uh, in, an important role, was its cosmopolitan function in introducing new texts and thought from China, because the Zen Buddhism was, was just adapted from uh, China and, uh, you know, Dogen would uh, you know, and going abroad and studying in China, for instance, and bringing these new texts and thought back. Um, and Zen Buddhism, as you may be aware, is, is focused especially, it's very simple, it's just focused on seated meditation. But this is quite different than the very abstract um, 
in a way, inaccessible forms of Buddhism that had been popular among uh, the aristocracy up to this point. Okay, so I want to just read this. It's a kind of a long quote, but it's an interesting quote from one of Nichiren's main texts, the uh, Rectification for the Peace of the Nation. And it, it says, In recent years there are there are unusual disturbances in the heavens, strange occurrences on earth, famine and pestilence, all affecting every corner of the empire and spreading throughout the land. Oxen and horses lie dead in the streets. The bones of the stricken crowd the highways. Over half the population has already been carried off by death, and in every family someone grieves. All the while, some put their whole faith in the sharp sword of the Buddha Amida and intone his name of intone this name of the Lord of the Western Paradise. Uh, so this would be referencing Jodo Shu, Jodo Shinshu, right? There are also those who follow the secret teachings of the Shingon sect and conduct esoteric rituals, while others devote themselves entirely to Zen-type meditation and perceive the emptiness of all phenomena as clearly as the moon. So he's referencing all these other kind of new uh, Buddhist sects that are in a way competing for followers at the time. Yet, despite these efforts, they merely exhaust themselves in vain. Famine and disease rage more fiercely than ever. Beggars are everywhere in sight, and scenes of death fill our eyes. Cadavers pile up in mounds like observation platforms. Dead bodies lie side by side like planks on a bridge. So, we get a sense here of a couple of different things. First is um, how the historical background of the time uh, influenced the emergence of these new religions and then kind of explains why people might have been especially attracted to them. Um, there were a lot of, uh, this was a tumultuous time, uh, and there, there were, as Nietzsche then describes in here, famine and pestilence, strange occurrences on earth, uh, earthquakes, fires, and we'll see this is, is also reflected in the literature of the time as well. Um, so Nietzsche then you know, in a way, is seeking an explanation for these things in religion. Um, but we also notice the dogmatic aspect of his thought when he calls out these other sects that are competing for followers as uh, exhausting themselves in vain. So he's saying this, you know, my teaching is the only true teaching. Okay, so I mentioned literature then, and one of the, the most famous pieces from the time is Kamono Chome's An Account of My Hut, Hojoki. This was written the same year as the death of Honen, and uh, unsurprisingly, it contains a lot of Buddhist themes, because Buddhism was, as I've been uh, talking about, very popular at this time and very important in people's lives. But it was not an abstract Buddhism. Instead, it was an, a pessimistic Buddhism Reflecting the new thought, but also the disasters during the late Heian <clears throat> and early uh, uh, Kamakura period. Um, so, for instance, uh, Kamono Chome describes in the writing, in the text, a large fire that ravaged the capital in 1177. In 1180, strong winds wreaked havoc. In 1181, there was a famine. And in 1185, a large earthquake. The author then, because of these things, he decides to, um, you know, he, he sees, he realizes how the earth, earthly life is just full of suffering. Um, a very Buddhist concept, of course, but he notices it especially acutely because of these disasters going on at the time. And then he also combines this with another Buddhist uh, thought that the root of uh, suffering is desire and attachment. So, he decides to give up um, all of his earthly possessions and adopt an ascetic life, uh, living in a, a secluded hut outside of the capital in the woods. <clears throat> and then the rest of his uh, account is, is describing the life in his hut. So it's kind of like a precursor to uh, Thoreau's Walden, in a way, if you want to find a comparison in Western literature. But Walden, of course, came centuries, many centuries after this. And I wanted to read some uh, quotes from Kamono Chome's uh, Hojoki to give an idea, kind of a sense of, of the contents of that work. 
Some faint reports have reached my ears that in the wise reigns of former days the country was ruled with clemency. Then the imperial palace with, was thatched with straw, and not even the eaves were aligned. When the emperor saw that the smoke rising from the kitchen fires was thin, he went so far as to remit the taxes, although they were not excessive. That was because he loved his people and sought to help them. If we compare the present conditions with those of ancient times, we may see how great is the difference. <clears throat> this is uh, an interesting example of intertextuality, actually. Kamono Chome is referencing a much older, older myth dating all the way from the Kojiki that was then later adapted and referenced in the Manyoshu, and now he's taking it again, talking about the importance of the emperor being benevolent to his people and being concerned about their welfare. Um, but he takes this to contrast it with the present times to make kind of a political mes message, actually, indicating how average people are suffering and they seem to have been abandoned by their rulers. Uh, in another quote, the number of those who died of starvation outside the gates or along the roads may not be reckoned. There being no one even to dispose of the bodies, a stench filled the whole world, and there were many signs of decomposing bodies too horrible to behold. Um, so here he's talking about the, this horrible famine that struck the land um, and describing some of these scenes of destruction and death at the time. People with no other means of living, living were robbing the old temples of their holy images or breaking up the furnishings of the sacred halls for firewood. It was because I was born in a world of foulness and evil that I was forced to witness such heartbreaking signs. So here we have um, an interesting description, again, of the effects of these disasters and famines on a daily people, average people's daily lives. In one sense, it, turn, it made many people turn toward religion, but at the same time, religion, as he shows in this quote, did not win out over practical concerns of day-to-day -day survival so that people would be robbing the old temples. And he describes this as a very heartbreaking uh, scene, you know, ind indicating his own religious devoutness. Um, and then he says, only in a hut built for the moment can one live without fear. So this is the general attitude then that he adopts in response to um, these disasters that he has described. Another important piece of writing from the time uh, was Yoshida Kenko's Essays in Idleness, uh, Tsudezure Gusa. And <clears throat> here the uh, political message is probably not so overt, um, and he doesn't go so far as uh, Kamono Chome to adopt, uh, adopt uh, religious asceticism. Um, instead, he just includes a series of brief reflections on the transience of earthly life. So there's Still certainly, um, and, and this is, I, I would say, where there's the most overlap between Kamano Chome's work as well, uh, as he includes this Buddhist idea of, you know, the impermanence of earthly life. Um, but he mainly discusses a, you know, a sense of ideal aesthetics, uh, issues of morality and ethics, and then small pleasures and delights uh, that he uh, derives from different things. So, for instance, uh, he writes, to sit alone in lamplight with a book spread out before you and hold intimate converse with men of unseen generations, such as a pleasure beyond compare. This is quite a nice quote, actually, um, for anyone, especially for anyone who loves uh, to read. And we can certainly, I think, uh, uh, you know, empathize with this uh, quote. And we can see also, you know, how he's focusing on these small pleasures in life uh, instead of just amassing wealth and power, and he's pointing out how these things can bring much more happiness. Um, it is well for a man to be frugal, to abstain from luxury, to possess no treasure, nor to covet this world's goods, since olden times there has rarely been a sage who was wealthy. So, again, he includes these kind of, you know, interesting uh, tidbits of wisdom, basically, that are, in a sense, religious. I mean, uh, sounds like something a religious leader might have said. Um, you know, don't covet worldly goods, etc., something like that. Um, so there's, you know, he's reflecting the religious thought of the time, but at the same, doesn't, same time doesn't go so far as Kamono Chome to uh, live in a hut in the woods somewhere. 
Okay, I want to kind of shift gears a little bit and move from the cultural sphere back into the uh, political uh, sphere and talk about the fall of the Kamakura Bakufu. Um, the Kamakura Bakufu during its end days was plagued by internal difficulties that probably began with the Mongol invasions of uh, the mid to late 13th century, which, as I mentioned in last le the last lecture, put a lot of pressure on the Bakufu coffers. Um, they had trouble paying soldiers, you know, and, and investing uh, so many funds into the military. There's also internal conflict between, you know, uh, basically what were succe uh, succession conflicts, uh, especially between Hojo Saratoki uh, and his widow and son, Takatoki, and uh, another competing faction, Nagasaki uh, Takasuke, who was the Uchi Kande which was one of the highest uh, positions of, of government in the Kamakura Bakufu. Um, and there were, there were also, the government was also battling then um, bands of local warriors in the provinces who were disgruntled with Kamakura rule uh, and kind of resorting to their own means of, and methods of, um, you know, obtaining goods and, and going about daily life. Uh, the the bak Kamakura Bakufu, though, re referred to them as what can be translated as bandits, uh, akto, these, uh, you know, groups of, like, roving wild criminals, <clears throat> who in most cases, though, were, were actually just disgruntled local warriors. Um, and eventually then, Emperor Godaigo, uh, who was interested in restoring uh, his own political power, but also power to the throne, taking it away from the Kamakura shoguns, joined forces with some other people who, variously for their own reasons in many cases, then, uh, you know, also wanted to overthrow the Kamakura uh, government. Ashikaga Takauji, uh, Kusunoke, Kusunoki Masashige, Nita Yoshisada, uh, to overthrow then the Kamakura Bakufu which they successfully uh, did. But especially Ashikaga Takauji had his own motivations for um, fighting against the Kamakura Bakufu, many of them personal. Uh, he did not like the Hojo, and he himself had connections with the Minamoto. Um, and uh, he eventually split with Godaigo and built... Uh, his new capital, then a new capital in the Muromachi area of Kyoto. So this marks the beginning of the Muromachi period. Um, but this split then between Takauji and Godaigo led to another ongoing conflict and, and a very important succession conflict for Japanese history because there were uh, essentially then they promoted two different emperors at the time. Godaigo claiming legitimacy for himself and setting up a southern court uh, south of Kyoto and Ashikaga and his allies setting up a northern court and, and claiming legitimacy uh, to the throne uh, there. And eventually the northern court, Ashikaga, uh, won out. Ashikaga Yoshimitsu ended the southern court in 1392. Um, but, you know, there's al this has always been kind of a, a, a lingering, you know, question of which one was actually legitimate. And it's not really an important question, but um, later in Japanese history, the idea of this unbroken line of uh, emperors or imperial succession comes up. And then historians promoting that view or people promoting that view would then have to come back to this issue of like, well, what do we do with the northern and southern courts period uh, when there were essentially two emperors at the same time claiming legitimacy? And... This event as well was, in this time period, was, was uh, described in the literature of the time in uh, these kind of, uh, you know, war writings. And the most famous one is the Taiheiki, uh, translated as the Chronicle of Great Peace, which recounted the Kenmu, rest, uh, Kenmu Restoration, so this would be the overthrow of the Kamakura Bakufu and establishment of a new government by Godaigo and then the Ashikaga and the fight between the northern and southern courts uh, by showing local loyal virtues. It also then emphasized the loyal virtues of the warriors fighting for Godaiko. And then in this way, the Taiheiki uh, implicitly argued for 
the legitimacy of the southern court over the northern court. Um, and then in addition to this, at the same time, uh, the, the northern southern court struggle also emph emphasized uh, a broader underlying conflict between the warrior bouquet class and the court aristocracy, the kuge or kugyo. Uh, and there was this lingering question of who had the right to rule. Um, is it the warrior class? Is it the aristocracy? You know, and then how much power should be granted to the warrior class? So I want to talk about the Middle Manchi period a little bit. Uh, the Ashikaga shoguns had less authority and power than the Kamakura Bakufu. And therefore, they relied more on local governor, Shugo, uh, to increase their own power. And alliances with the Shugo, for instance, and letting Shugo have more autonomy over their own provinces. Um, they continued to struggle to control the Kanto and, oops, sorry, the Kanto and Kyushu regions. And even in Kyoto, where they were located, uh, there was a dual, essentially a dual structure of power between the court nobles and the Ashikaga. And this kind of dual uh, struct power structure is referred to as Kenmo and Seika. Uh, another way, though, that the Ashikaga attempted to kind of overcome this and to legitimatize themselves to gain uh, more, more power was through establishing connections with the Ming Dynasty in China and especially establishing trade uh, with the Ming Dynasty. So in 1401, um, Ashikaga Yoshimitsu began what is called Kongo Boeki in this trade with the Ming Dynasty. Uh, this helped the Ming Dynasty suppress Wako pirates, these groups of uh, kind of international groups of pirates who would roam the water and disturbing Japanese and Chinese ships. Many of them were Japanese uh, as well. Uh, it increased the power of the Ashikaga Bakfu by giving them legitimacy, like, you know, they signed treaties now basically with still the most powerful uh, government in East Asia at the time. Um, and it, they gained increased money from trade and benefited from more cultural interaction, and this continued until uh, 1547. And then Yoshimitsu and the Ashikaga shoguns, but Yoshimitsu especially, patronized uh, the arts, and this was another way that they tried to gain, I guess, legitimacy maybe in the cultural sphere, in addition to having genuine uh, interests uh, in the arts. And at this time, so the Murumanchi period is especially famous for uh, the development of no theater of no drama. And the main uh, actors and playwrights who developed that were Kanami and his son Zayami, and they were patronized by Yoshimitsu. And they developed a no drama, as I mentioned, by combining sarugaku, uh, an earlier form of uh, performative uh, story drama and storytelling. Okay, so then reflecting back on the contents of my lecture, I just want to uh, throw some questions out there uh, that uh, are important to think about and to understand this uh, time period. Uh, first, what made new Buddhist sects like Jodo Shinshu so radical and popular, and why did the elite fear them? Second, how did literature such as Kamono Chome's An Account of My Hut and Yoshida Kenko's Essays in Idleness reflect and describe the social and religious background of the time. Third, describe some of the causes and events leading up to the overthrow of the Kamakura Bakfu and the Kenmu Restoration. And fourth, how did the Ashikaga shoguns attempt to solidify their political rule and what challenges did they face? So that concludes my talk for today. Uh, we looked mainly at some of the main cultural developments, religious developments of uh, the, during the Kamakura period. And then I also talked about the uh, overthrow of the Kamakura government and the establishment of uh, the, a new group of shoguns, the Ashikaga shoguns, and the start of the Mudomachi uh, period. So uh, I hope now we have a pretty good idea of most of the Middle Ages of this time period and some of the main developments. 
In future talks, uh, we'll just be moving on chronologically and looking at, uh, after this, then uh, the beginning of uh, the Warring States uh, period and leading into uh, the Tokugawa period. I hope you found this uh, to be entertaining and uh, have learned something from it, and thank you for listening.